is being organized uh, by uh, Rice Center for Quantum Materials, as Matt already said, and uh, we thank uh, the National Science Foundation, the uh, APTQ's uh, program of the Moore Foundation, uh, as well as the ICAM for support. So, uh, and let me add very importantly, uh, let's, uh, I would like to thank uh, Jenny Whitaker, who is um, um, being the force behind all the organization and uh, she's also administering the, uh, this Zoom uh, 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 meetings uh, uh, for throughout the week. So with that, uh, without further ado, let me turn it back to Matt. Okay, so our first speaker today is Jennifer Cano from Stony Brook and Flatiron, and she's going to tell us about topological quantum chemistry. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Matt, Shimao, and organizers for having me. So, uh, so the task was to try to give a pedagogical talk. So I will try to not only um, give a I'd like to convey the purpose of this theory of topological quantum chemistry, but, but also give a little bit more of the details so you can see the inner workings of this theory and how it works. Um, and then I'll spend the last few minutes talking about some more recent work in my group at Stony Brook University, which is kind of a teaser for, um, for more conversation at the fall conference. So, so the theory of topological quantum chemistry seeks to answer the following questions. The first question is, how do we get a complete classification of topological insulators with crystal symmetry? So before this theory, before we developed this, the classification of topological crystal and insulators was done in somewhat ad hoc way, which is that uh, different symmetry operations separately were considered and topological invariants were developed for each of these. So for example, mirror symmetry or rotational symmetry. Um, but most space groups have many symmetries. And so we sought to answer this question of how do these different symmetries interplay with each other? Or in other words, if you have a band structure and you have some valence bands and you wanna know if those bands are topological, what is, what is the answer that you should look for? Um, and if you, if you, for example, compute all invariants for each space group element individually, is that going to give you the same thing as if you had a classification for the full space group? The second question that, uh, that we want to answer is how can we find topological materials? So uh, the classification of topological invariants is done in momentum space and it usually results in some answer like these symmetries will give you a Z4 classification. But the periodic table is not divided neatly into these different classifications. And so there's a disconnect between finding materials that realize certain topological invariants. And so the main goal of this theory is to capture all crystal symmetries and also have predictive power to predict topological materials. So to start, we need to have an operating definition of what it means to be topological. So we can look at two band structures and they may look identical to each other, but if we then plot them in a slab configuration, the atomic insulator or trivial insulator will have no surface states and the topological insulator will have surface states. So obviously just looking at the uh, energy as a function of momentum or the dispersion is not enough to tell us about topology, which we already knew. So the operating definition that we're gonna work with is that um, a group of bands is topological or is trivial if it has maximally localized Vanier functions that satisfy crystal symmetry. Um, that, that is to say that if you take this group of bands and kind of slowly turned off all the different couplings between atoms at different sites, you would end up with a set of orbitals sitting at different atoms and they would transform in a certain way under symmetry and that would be the definition of Vanier functions. And this is what we call an atomic limit because you can really think of this, the Vanier functions basically tell you about localized orbitals sitting at different atoms. And if you're in one of these atomic limit phases, then it makes sense that you don't have surface states. So for example, if you have say a, um, one atomic limit phase next to another atomic limit phase, both of these things have localized Vanier functions and they may slowly interpolate to get into each other, but there's no need to close any gap. Um, in contrast to that, if you don't have maximally localized Vanier functions, then something different will happen. And so if you think of, if you have an example in your head, say think of bismuth selenide, 
uh, where the bands are inverted at the gamma point. In bismuth selenide, say at the gamma point, the, um, the bands have say a p orbital character, but at all the other trim points, they have an s orbital character. So there is no real space Vanier function that can capture both of those symmetries at once. If you put this next to some normal insulator, then somewhere there needs to be an inversion. You need to have all S or all P. And so the conduction and valence bands need to unswap or uninvert. And that band closing is exactly the way that you get gapless surface states. So this is our operational definition of a topological insulator is one which does not have maximally localized Vanier functions uh, that satisfy crystal symmetry. We'll define the converse of that as the trivial insulators will be these atomic limits, which do have maximally localized Vanier functions. So our plan of attack is if we can enumerate all of these different atomic limits, then we can identify topological bands as those which are not atomic limit phases. Right now I phrase this completely generally, so it seems like it might not be useful at all. Um, because we can enumerate atomic limits in many different ways. Uh, for, for example, we could enumerate an atomic limit as having a trivial topological invariant. And so then step two is not very useful. The useful thing is if we can enumerate the atomic limits by their symmetry eigenvalue. So if we can make a list for each of these atomic limit phases and say at all the high symmetry points, these are the eigenvalues that we get. Then we can do an ab initio calculation of some material that we want to know about, and we can compare its symmetry eigenvalues to this list of atomic limits. And this will give us a useful way to, uh, to compare our list of atomic limits to say uh, high throughput ab initio, it's meant to say ab initio calculations. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. We're gonna to try to classify all possible atomic limits by their symmetry. And this will end up being their symmetry properties in real space because the atomic limits kind of live in real space and in terms of Vanier functions. Then we Fourier transform this and we'll get their ear and momentum space. And that will serve as a key to identify that particular atomic limit. So to carry out this plan, here's the, the starting point. Um, the first thing we need to know is uh, 3D crystals are, the symmetry groups of 3D crystals are space groups. So a space group consists of some set of point group operations like rotations, mirrors, and then also some lattice translations. And this is, this is the lattice translations that build up a 3D crystal from these point group operations. And in addition, of course, each of the space groups has a Bruin zone, which tells us, um, tells us about the Fourier transform of, um, of this lattice. So symmetries in 3D are classified by space groups, but within one space group, the space group doesn't specify how you how to uniquely arrange atoms. There's many different atomic configurations that satisfy the symmetries of the space group. So for example, if we have the symmetry group consisting of a six-fold rotation and mirrors and translation symmetry, we can get a triangular lattice but we can also get honeycomb lattice and we can also get a Kaugame lattice. The difference between these lattices is the number of atoms per unit cell, um, but also there's a, there's a more important difference, which is that you can think of the, each one of these lattices has, has a different group of symmetries that leave one atom invariant. So for example, if we look at the triangular lattice, and if we, if we do a six-fold rotation or a mirror reflection, each atom is invariant under all those operations. So that's why there's only one atom in the unit cell. But if we now look at the honeycomb lattice, then something different happens. Each atom is invariant under say a three-fold rotation. But if you do a six-fold rotation, you'll exchange the A and B sublattices. So on the honeycomb lattice, there's some operations that mix A to B. And similarly on the Kaugame lattice, each atom is invariant under a two-fold rotation, but if you do a six-fold rotation, you'll mix A, B, C sublattices. So each one of these configurations can be labeled by the subgroup of symmetries that leaves one atom invariant. And that's what's called a Wyckoff position. Um, the Wyckoff position is just a way of labeling these different types of configurations. And the other important point is that once you have one of these configurations, 
um, all of the atoms are related by symmetry. So for the triangular lattice, it's obvious each atom is related to each other atom by a combination of translations. But in the honeycomb lattice, half the atoms are related to other atoms by translations. And then the other half, you need to like first do a six-fold rotation to swap sublattices and then do translations. So in any case, all atoms are related to all other atoms by some combination of symmetry uh, operations. And um, you can classify each of these by the group of symmetries that leaves one atom invariant. Okay, so now we've talked about a space group and the Wyckoff position, which tells us about the position of atoms. But there's one other thing which, which defines a Vanier uh, function, which is um, what is the orbital content? So now suppose that we have our honeycomb lattice, what are the orbitals that we have on each atom? And of course, every atom has every possible orbital, but the question we're really asking here is, if you were to make a tight binding model, what are the orbitals near the Fermi level? Or if you, which, which is exactly giving us what are the Vanier functions? So each different choice of orbital gives us a different atomic limit, or you can think of that as a different set of Vanier functions. And the consequence of this is that all of these symmetry attributes together, which is the space group, the atomic configuration, and the orbital content, that's all uh, labeling symmetry in real space. And it completely determines the irreps that appear in momentum space. So for example, if I have S orbitals on the honeycomb lattice, which has the same symmetry as PZ orbitals on the honeycomb lattice, I will always get this band structure. Uh, you know, the dispersion will depend on the, um, on the hopping magnitudes between different uh, sites, but you cannot avoid having this, you know, what we know is the Dirac cone and graphene. You absolutely cannot avoid this because this is transforming in a special way under symmetry. And we can completely get the symmetry and momentum space from how these atoms transform into each other in real space. And similarly, if we were to look at PX and PY orbitals, which is um, a different orbital content and plot a band structure, you will always get a band structure that looks like this. It has a Dirac point, but it also has two single bands. And, and now there's some freedom, which is that we don't, you don't know from symmetry the order of these bands at each K point, but you can know their symmetry labels. Um, and so it highly constrains the sorts of band structures that you can get. And all the symmetry labels are completely determined by how the, um, orbitals and atoms transform in real space. Jen, I have a question. Yes. Um, uh, so with regards, you, you said uh, with regards to your statement where you always get a structure like the, a band structure like this for graphene. Mm -hmm. um, what about considerations like spin orbit coupling, no spin orbit coupling? So if no spin orbit coupling, then I see it, but with spin orbit coupling, then famously you open up yeah. a gap. Great. At the yeah. Point. Yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, that, that's a great point. So what I would say on, on a formal level, there's two different types of groups. The groups with and without, you can, let's say you have a space group and the space group consists of symmetry elements, but those symmetry elements act differently with and without spin orbit coupling. And you can actually think of these as two different groups. So if I say I have no spin orbit coupling, then I'll get this structure. If I have spin orbit coupling, I should actually look at a different group of symmetry labels and in that case, this, this thing will, will split. So, right, so you're bringing up, yeah, so that's a great point. With spin orbit coupling, there's a different set of labels. That's one way to say it. Got it, thank you. Which explicitly takes in the spin of the, of the wave function, I guess. That's the point, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. So, so basically what happens is that, um, one way to think of it is that the symmetry, we have a rotational symmetry here. And if you like our six fold rotation, and if you do the six fold rotation six times, you get a two pi rotation. And so you'll get some symmetry group where that two pi rotation gives you plus one identity element for spinless and minus one if you have spin. And so that gives you like this different group structure for both of them. Yeah. And actually, you know, you can always work in the case with spin orbit coupling. It will just give you like twice as many labels. There'll be different, there'll be slightly different labels. Um, and uh, it will always give you the right labels if you then set spin orbit coupling to zero, but you'll have some extra freedom because the orbitals will have, there'll be twice as many terms you can write down roughly speaking. So, um, so if you have zero spin orbit coupling, it's more useful to work in the group which corresponds to zero spin orbit coupling. 
Yeah. Okay, good. So basically, if you have spinorbic coupling, but you could also ask, what if I do or do not have time reversal? That also changes the group. And it's the same answer. You, when you specify your group, you also need to specify if you want to include spinorbic coupling and if you want to include time reversal. And then those things I'm all kind of counting as part of the space group. Okay, so I then wanted to give a little bit of a uh, background into, so I've made this kind of claim that you can get that the symmetry properties in real space give you these, these labels in momentum space. So I wanted to try to explain a little bit how this works. So the, the idea is that for every symmetry operation that you have, you can build a matrix. And so I'm, I'm just trying to make this procedure concrete. Um, your matrix, the rows and columns will be labeled by atoms and also orbitals in the unit cell. And so a symmetry that leaves one site invariant will have diagonal blocks in this matrix. And symmetries that mix different sites will have off diagonal blocks. And so you can think, if you think back of those lattices that I was trying, um, for every symmetry element, you can build such a matrix. It should, it's an infinite matrix, but it's not that hard to build this thing. Um, then you Fourier transform this. And when you Fourier transform it, now instead of having real space positions across the top and bottom, you'll end up with momentum space labels and also orbital information. And the diagonal blocks in momentum space correspond to symmetry elements that leave one K point invariant. So now if you plot your band structure, when you're plotting a band structure at each K point, bands will be degenerate if they transform um, as an irrep of the symmetry group that leaves this point invariant. And that group is generated by matrix elements that are diagonal in this momentum space representation. So in, that's how it works on a very concrete label. The hard part is making a consolidated notation that keeps track of these infinite matrices. And so to show some kind of example, um, so I'll show an example, the simplest example in 1D and in 2D, which is if you just have inversion symmetry. Uh, and so if you just have inversion symmetry and you just have S orbitals, then you will have one matrix for inversion, which will take the orbital at position X to position minus X. Um, so that gives you a completely off diagonal matrix. And you also have translation symmetry. And so this thing will give you a set of elements which are right off the diagonal of this matrix. You can also do this for P orbitals. You get basically the same matrices, except inversion gives you a set of minus ones. And now the, the next step is if you Fourier transform these matrices, then what you'll see is that for S orbitals, um, for example, at, at the gamma point, the, the wave function at gamma point is an equal superposition of all these orbitals. So it'll have a positive eigenvalue, um, positive inversion eigenvalue. And at K equals pi, it's the same thing. At K equals pi, it's not an equal superposition of all orbitals. It's plus minus, plus minus, but every plus, under inversion will map to an orbital with another plus. And so you get a plus sign under inversion symmetry at K equals pi. If you repeat this for P orbitals, you it's the same logic, you get minus inversion eigenvalues at K equals zero and K equals pi. Now you can also consider the same group of symmetries, but put the atoms in a different place. This is a, a different Wyckoff position. Instead of having the atoms sitting on the inversion center, they sit halfway across the unit cell away from the inversion center. And so what happens is that this swaps the inversion eigenvalue at k equals pi, because at k equals pi, the wave function is like plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. And so the inversion operation will swap a minus and a plus. It'll, it'll mix um, a minus and a plus atom into each other. And similarly for p orbitals, the inversion eigenvalue swaps at pi. So, in 1D, this is, this is the only possibility that you can get. There's four possible inversion combinations of inversion eigenvalues, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, or minus, plus. And these are also the only, since there's only two high symmetry K points and two possible inversion eigenvalues, this covers the entire space. So what we can learn is that in 1D, there are no topological phases. There's just atomic limits. And these atomic limits can be labeled in the following way. Uh, are the atoms sitting on the inversion center or off of the inversion center? And are the orbitals on each side even or odd under inversion symmetry? 
And that data is, that data completely enumerates all the atomic limits um, in this group. So Jen, can I, can I ask a question about that? So I, I'm often confused about this actually. So we know that according to this classification table for strong topological insulators and superconductors, there is a list yeah. of you know five of them that are topological, the Kataev chain, and then all of these uh, Sue, Schrieffer, Heger, yeah. um, like phases where you just dimerize mm -hmm. bonds. Mm -hmm. And they have zero modes, um, mm -hmm. yeah. but in another sense, they're very different from topological phases in more than one dimension where the surface states always, you know, connect up to the yeah. bulk and, and, you know, insert. so can you comment on, what do you mean that there aren't topological phases? Yeah, um, yeah exactly. So first off, I don't want to talk about Kataev chain because that's super conducting and, and sure. so, okay, fine. So, okay, so let's forget what? about Kataev chain in this classification. Um, but yeah, the SSH model is, is, a, is a really great point. So, um, right, so the SSH model is usually or it's often taught as being a topological phase. And, um, and the reason is because we can compute a Berry phase for each of these cases. And the first two cases will have a Berry phase of zero and the other two cases will have a Berry phase of pi. Basically the Berry phase tells us about polarization and the Berry phase is quantized with inversion symmetry. So it serves as a good topological invariant. Um, but, if we want to define a topological phase as one, it's kind of semantics. If you want to define a topological phase as one which you know has or does not have localized Vanier functions, then these, um, then all of these states should be counted as trivial phases. And so we invented some terminology um, to deal with this, like this discrepancy between well, you have a quantized Berry phase and you can have an edge state, but you're not topological. Really, so so we call this an obstructed atomic limit. The, the obstruction is that if you have atoms localized at the zero position at the inversion center and your Vanier function is localized at the half position off of the inversion center, then the obstruction is that you cannot get from one insulating phase with these eigenvalues, say plus plus, to another insulating phase with these eigenvalues plus minus without closing a gap. So it's two atomic limits, but there is a gap closing phase transition between them. Whether you you know, whether you want to call that, in some sense it's topological, in some sense it's not. I think that there should be, uh, I think that there, you know, someone just needs to define what they mean to be topological. And in, in our notation, we call these things obstructed atomic limits. And really the obstruction is, um, it depends on where your atoms are. So it's not, it's really a statement about like two different groups of bands. If your atoms are here and your orbitals are here, there's no obstruction. But if your atoms are sitting here and your orbitals are sitting here, then there's some obstruction to moving the orbitals, moving the Bonnier functions basically back onto the orbitals. And uh, that, okay, that's what the obstruction is. And that's why you see edge states because your atoms are sitting in one place, but your orbitals are sitting in another place. And so when you chop the system in half, then um, you're exactly slicing through the Bonnier functions. Yeah. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and this is actually, um, this is actually very related to the higher order topological insulators in 2D. Yeah, so in 2D, the higher order TIs have zero D uh, corner states and it's the exact same thing. There's an, there's, that's an obstructed atomic limit. Your atoms are sitting at the origin of the unit cell. Your body functions are sitting at say the half half position. And so then when you slice it, you end up with charge at the corners. And so I think that, I personally think that there should be a distinction between these um, two cases and I, I don't really care what we call it, but I think this notion of obstructed atomic limit to me kind of makes sense because it's still an atomic limit, but there is an obstruction. And it, in a sense, it is a topological obstruction because there's a quantized invariant that you can compute. Right, so I, I mean, I guess the, the thing I always find confusing about this is that it's clear with Schu, Schrieff, or Heger that there is a trivial atomic limit, which is you just turn off the dimerization between half the bonds. And if you have a, if you have a topological defect, like a real, mm -hmm. real space topological defect, then you're isolating a site and that's a zero mode. But mm -hmm. you shouldn't, you know, a, a normal topological insert, you shouldn't be able to just break it up into, uh, you know, have, a, have an atomic limit. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, exactly. So, right, so in a sense, it's just words. Yeah, I think it, it's words and it's just important to recognize that there's these two different cases and one of which is atomic limits where Vanier centers don't sit on orbitals and Vanier centers don't sit on atoms, I mean. And then the other case is you just don't have Bonnier centers at all that are localized. They don't have exponential decay.
yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's a that's a really important and interesting question. Um, okay, so that covers the 1D case. The interesting thing, so now if we extend this to 2D, now there's four different places we can consider having atoms, which is um, zero, 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 half, half, zero, and half, half. And then we can apply the exact same logic. We can say, well, are our atoms even or odd under inversion symmetry? And what are the inversion eigenvalues at all the inversion symmetric momentum space points? So we get two tables, one for inversion even orbitals and one for inversion odd orbitals. Um, but the thing that you'll see here is that in these tables, you always have an even number of minus signs. So like zero, two, 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 you know? So um, in, in both of these tables, that's always a, an attribute. So unlike the 1D case, there's now a possibility of having bands. If your bands have an odd number of inversion eigenvalues, then you do not match up with any of these atomic limits. Uh, that's something that, you know, that we just saw can't happen in 1D, can happen in 2D. And so this is basically reproducing the Foucane inversion eigenvalue formula, uh, which, which tells you that you should, it tells you the same thing. If you, if you have an odd number of odd inversion eigenvalues, then, um, then you're not a Z2TI. Now the Foucane, this classic Foucane paper is a lot stronger because they actually prove that if you have a, um, that they actually prove that if you have this odd number of odd inversion eigenvalues, that you have a non-trivial Z2 invariant. Here we're using crystal symmetry, uh, so we're not we're not telling you what invariant you have. We're just saying that if you had an odd number of odd inversion eigenvalues, then you wouldn't match up with any of these atomic limit phases, and so you could deduce that you were not in a trivial phase. But you don't know what crystal symmetry might be protecting you. Okay, so that was kind of meant to be a. Um, kind of a, the most, the example to keep in your mind when discussing this, this, uh, these ideas. Um, think of these inversion eigenvalues and there's a different set of inversion eigenvalues that characterize each atomic limit. Um, and therefore, if you have a group of bands whose inversion eigenvalues don't match one of these atomic limits, then you are not in an atomic limit phase. Now, what we wanna do is just apply this to all symmetries, all symmetry groups, all space groups, or all orbitals. But this is the picture you should have in your mind. I wanted to just say something a little bit more um, mathy, just in case anyone is listening and interested in this. So just to phrase this in the group theory language, um, each one of these orbitals defines a representation, a representation of what, well, like I was saying for, once you have a space group and an atomic configuration, there is a set of symmetries that leaves one atom invariant. An orbital is an irrep of that group. It's a point group. So it's an irrep of a point group. That from that particular irrep of the point group, you can induce a representation of a space group. And this procedure of induction is completely well defined uh, from a group theory standpoint. And what it's basically telling you is if I have one orbital on one lattice site, I know how to get a different orbital on a different lattice site just by acting with symmetries, um, some rotations, some translations, and I'll move that orbital to a different lattice site in a, in a uniquely specified way. And then finally, there's also an operation called subduction, which says now I have a representation of my full space group. I will um, restrict it to the set of operations that leave one K point invariant. And that gives me the irreps that appear uh, in my band structure at high symmetry points. So, so this, this whole thing is just to say, these, this is the mathematical language to describe this. And this is, um, you know, falls under the name of group theory or representation theory. For our purposes, we can consider this to be a black box, which is you input space group, atom positions, orbitals, you output a set of EREPs. And so this was the idea which was promoted and studied uh, intensively by Zach in the 1980s. And he said, we should call this a band representation because usually when you talk about um, band structures, you're, you make a K dot P model around one K point, but how do the K, these representations at different K points link to each other? I wanna know the symmetry of the entire band. And that's exactly what I'm just discussing. So this was all introduced by Zach uh, in the 1980s. Now, so far I've been talking about having like one atom and one orbital in the unit cell, 
uh, but now we can just add these things together because representations can always be added together. And so if you have multiple orbitals, if you want to make a type binding model um, and you have multiple relevant orbitals or you have multiple atoms, then you just add these things together and you just get some set of labels. And that list gets bigger and bigger as you go on. Um, but now we reach a problem, which is that I said that we wanted to, um, we wanted to make a list of all the different atomic limits but now you can see that this list will be infinite because we can always keep adding more and more atoms or orbitals to the unit cell and getting bigger and bigger representations. So the question is, how can we enumerate this infinite list? And the answer is that there's a finite basis for this. So similarly, how representations can always be written as sums of EREPs, and there's always a finite number of EREPs that they decompose into these band representations decompose into a set of elementary band representations. The elementary band representations are defined as those which do not decompose into other elementary band representations. So by definition, they're just the basic unit. Zach called these the building bricks or building blocks um, of the band representations. And it turns out that there's only a finite number of these. And so why, why is there a finite number? Well, when I was talking about EREPs or orbital content, the, or, the orbitals will be EREPs for the EBRs. So every group only has a finite number of EREPs. And then in addition, when I was talking about the, the Wyckoff positions or different configurations of atoms, um, the EBRs, the elementary band representations only come from atoms sitting at high symmetry points. So these two points taken together tell us that this basis set of elementary band representations is finite, but it's actually a large number so, well, it depends on your definition of large, but we might estimate this and say, well, we have, um, you know, around 200 space groups. Each one of these has a few maximal sym symmetric uh, positions of atoms and has a few EREPs for each of those. So you, if I multiply these numbers together, I might estimate that there's about 2000 of these. And that turns out to be right. Um, going back to the thing I said before, we can break these into categories of spin orbit coupling or no spin orbit coupling and time reversal or no time reversal. And each one of these categories has roughly a couple thousand of these elementary band representations. So to understand all of these, um, you know, is obviously something that requires a computer, but it's also a very manageable number. There's about 10,000 total. So then the next step in this is um, working with, uh, collaborating with um, the people who run the Bilbao crystallographic server. So this is a very neat website, which lists lots of attributes of crystals. And so we've added an application to this website um, as part of this collaboration, which is as follows. So basically you go to this website, uh, you click on this tool called band rep, you type in your space group, and then you can select whether you want to have time reversal or which Wyckoff positions you're interested in. But then you get a table that looks like this. And so this table, the first row of the table tells me how atoms are arranged. That's the Wyckoff positions. The second row tells me about orbital content. Uh, and finally, the last rows are all, these are the EREPs that appear at high symmetry points. And so this is just the output of this, um, of this black box that I tried to give some insight into. And so this actually accomplishes the first thing that I mentioned at the, at the beginning of this talk. So now if I have some band structure, some mystery band structure, and I wanna know are the valence bands topological, I can compute the EREPs at high symmetry points. And then I can log on to the Bilbao crystallographic server. I can compare those EREPs to the EREPs for atomic limits. Since those, um, since those atomic limit phases are a basis, I should be able to add any number of them. But if I add any number of those and I don't get back the EREPs in my band structure, then I know that my band structure is not an atomic limit phase. And so you can think of these symmetry EREPs as, um, or you can think of these symmetry labels as forming a topological invariant because any smooth deformation of bands cannot change the symmetry labels that appear. The only way to change symmetry labels is a band inversion with the, between the conduction and valence bands. And, um, and I want to mention that some similar ideas were developed at the same time by these collaborations um, using, different, using different perspectives and different methods, but basically arriving, uh, arriving at the same result. Okay, so this accomplishes our goal 
of identifying topological bands um, in any space group. So now we can carry out a search for topological materials. So what we can do is scan some kind of materials database, uh, compute the band structure of each um, of each material. We really only need the band structure at high symmetry points. We need to know symmetry irreps. And then we can compare all of these irreps to the irreps that appear on the Bilbao crystallographic server. And so this was actually carried out um, now a couple of years ago, uh, built into this website, actually two websites. So the first is by Andre Bernavig's group, this topological quantum chemistry.com. And the second is by Chen Fong's group um, at the same time. These websites do essentially the same thing. You can click through the elements that you want um, to select a list of compounds which have been mined from some crystal structure database, and it will um, spit out the band structure and spit out the topological invariance. And so this is actually a pretty neat thing because it, it combines a lot of major databases. It's taking in um, crystals from the ICSD, which is the Inorganic Crystal Structure Database, comparing that against our band rep tool on the Bilbao Crystallographic Server, and it's also interfaced with um, materials project. So I think this is a very, it has limitations. It's a high throughput calculation, but I think it's a very uh, neat combination of these uh, free, freely available um, ma massive databases that are available online. Okay, so that's materials prediction, um, which was, well, at least materials classification. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention um, is that we can also predict materials without using the database. And so there's some kind of neat, um, this, is, this is what we did before the database was built. There's some neat thing here, which is that these elementary band representations, they all transform, each one describes an atomic limit, but some of them can realize insulators. So they can realize bands which are gapped. And so you could have, um, this is meant to be a schematic sort of band structure. If all of these bands transform as an elementary band representation, but there's an insulating band gap, can it be that this is elementary and this is elementary each half? Well, no, because by definition, we define the elementary band representations as those which cannot be further decomposed into other elementary band representations. So, we actually learned something here, which is that there's two different types of topological bands. Uh, one type is all the bands in the band structure transformed together as an elementary band representation, but that elementary band representation can be real, can realize an insulator. Its bands can separate, even though they all transform in real space together. And this is actually the thing that happens um, for graphene. It doesn't require an inversion. The inversion is already built in. On the other hand, mercury telluride and bismuth selenide, these things uh, are made up of two band representations, say a P and S orbitals, and these things have to swap. Um, and that requires finite spin orbit strength. So we can, on a topological level, there's no difference, but there's, I think, a, a difference in how to understand these different types of topological bands. And these disconnected elementary band representations are kind of special because they don't require a finite, a critical strength of spin orbit coupling. In the case of bismuth selenide or mercury telluride, you need to have a critical strength of spin orbit coupling exceeded to drive a band inversion. Here, you just need infinitesimal spin orbit coupling. Um, and so these actually can be predicted. And so before the database of topological materials, materials was built, we predicted some of these in our original paper. Um, so this actually contributes to one column one row in the Bilbao crystallographic server that I didn't mention, which is says decomposable and decomposable. Really, that means can the bands gap or not? And for all of these elementary band representations where it says decomposable, that means that these bands can realize an insulating band structure. And when they do that, um, the top and bottom bands will be topological bands. And if I could click this button, it would tell me the irreps of, of the conduction and valence bands. So there's maybe multiple possibilities. So we predicted at that time, we predicted a few classes of materials. Um, each one of these is representative of a larger family that, uh, that realizes a topological phase where in real space, these things transform together as one elementary band representation, but in momentum space, they split. Um, and we predicted these by looking for them. We said, well, these are the space groups 
where there's elementary band representations that can split. And so if you fill this thing at half filling in this elementary band representation, you realize an insulator that's not trivial. So there's a couple of examples of these. Um, these ones are kind of nice. They're stacked square nets, which realize line nodes without spin orbit coupling. And if you add spin orbit coupling, a gap opens. So this is kind of similar to the kind of similar to the case of graphene. And there's a few examples of this where you can see these small band gaps, but they're present. Um, and then the other point to make is that we can also predict uh, we can also predict metals in this way because there's other um, there's other combinations of symmetry eigenvalues that can never lead to an insulator, and that's also captured in that decomposable and decomposable button. So um, since I'm kind of running short on time, although this is basically the end of the things that I wanted to say, uh, to summarize the the main point here is that we have this classification of band topology and we have some freely available tools to classify topological materials. And also, you know, the Bilbao crystallographic server is more than that. Um, if you are in the business of building band structures, it tells you useful information. What are the symmetry eigenvalues that you're gonna get? How will your bands transform in momentum space? What are the degeneracies? All that information is available, even if you're not interested in, um, in topology. The other point that I want to say here is that this whole process also gave rise to kind of a refined notion of topological bands. You know, we were talking earlier about the SSH model. Um, there's a lot more discussion that can be had there about different types of band topology, which uh, some of which was understood before and some of which I think wasn't or wasn't appreciated. And so um, then it seems like maybe everything is done. And so I just wanted to um, pose some open questions, which are, the topological quantum chemistry materials database tells us about existing materials. But I think one of the open questions still, and this will always be an open question, is how can we predict new materials that aren't in the database? Um, and so, so this is one of the things that, that I've been working on a little bit. Um, I'll mention this in a second, but in collaboration with Leslie Shoup, uh, if we focus on a specific class of materials, say these square net materials, um, what are the chemical, can we combine what we know about topology and symmetry with some chemical guidelines in order to predict uh, which of these compounds will be topological? Another question is this classification, um, you know, this classification scheme by symmetry eigenvalues has given rise to many new types of topological crystalline insulators and semi-metals, but some of them don't have surface states because they're protected by symmetry. And if the surfaces break that symmetry, then there's no signature. And so there's a question, which is how can we measure these things um, beyond surface states? And you know, another thing is for the higher order topological insulators, they don't have surface states, but they have hinge states. So how can we effectively measure hinge states? So I think uh, this is kind of an interesting question beyond classification. Another point is that uh, symmetry indicators don't tell us everything. There are some space groups that, um, where the symmetry indicators don't give you the topological classification. And so, so there's some more work to be done there. Maybe, maybe there's nothing more to say. Maybe there's some other very phase and variance that can be interesting. And of course, the focus of this upcoming workshop is the application to interacting materials. So, um, so I just, just wanted to mention, since everything I've been talking about is really not recent, I feel like, and I feel an obligation to mention, mention some more current research in my group, which is addressing um, these questions that I just discussed. So how can we predict new topological materials? Uh, what are the, some revised classification schemes and what are some observables for different types of topological phases beyond surface states? And I think, I think I'll just skip these next slides, which are meant to kind of be a little bit of a, a teaser for the fall. So we've been working a lot on topological semi-metals, various that encompasses all of these three points, prediction, classification, measurement, um, and there's, okay, there's not enough time to talk about all of this. Um, similarly, thinking about higher order TIs, we've developed some invariants to predict corner states using symmetry eigenvalues, which is directly um, extending the topological quantum chemistry formalism. Also thinking about higher order TIs and dislocations. And then this question of topological band theory versus interactions. There's been some interesting work here recently um, but I think, I think the field is wide open here. Everything that I've said is about band structures. 
And even when we were developing this theory and thinking about material predictions, we encountered some situations where interactions break down the theory, uh, which is that we, um, we predicted this copper bismuth oxide material to be a topological semi-metal because uh, we could tell from the representations that at half filling, it, this was going to have this crossing, which should roughly be near the Fermi level. And in fact, this thing is a known, a well-known insulator. Um, and so, so one question is how, is there some useful aspect of our classification that remains in the presence of interactions? If these semi-metallic points are gapped with interactions, is there anything topological left or is it just a trivial insulator? Um, and so this material was investigated uh, a bit here using DMFT, but I think there's a lot of questions in this whole area. Okay, so this is, um, this is my summary slide. Uh, you know, the main takeaway is that this theory is meant, the theory of topological quantum chemistry is meant to make a connection between real space classification of crystals and momentum space classification of topological invariants. We've used this to predict and classify topological materials. And I think this theory has a lot of interesting future applications uh, that I hope people, including myself, will pursue. So thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Great. Thanks, Jen. Um, okay, so what, why don't we just, uh, anybody who has a question, uh, okay, so, okay. Yes, it's getting a complicated. So I see, let's start with, the first one I saw was Pavel Volkov. So Pavel, you wanna ask? Yes, please. Um, thank you. I want to ask about the, actually the, 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 the last slide, this copper bismuth uh, oxide compound. Uh, does this uh, does the symmetry of this compound measured in experiments correspond to one calculated by DFT? Because one one way you can you know uh, the the predictions can deviate is that if the symmetry is broken somehow by structural transition or something that is not captured by DFT, then you can open gaps at uh, Dirac points and so on. Yes, yes. So right, there's there's very important. There's a lot going on here. So so in answer to your question. I think that the structure agrees. Um, the other thing, of course, that can happen is that this material has a magnetic phase. So in the magnetic phase, you're going to break the, our, the calculation here is uh, with time reversal symmetry and, um, right, with time reversal symmetry and spin orbit coupling, no magnetism. So in the magnetic phase, this theory will obviously definitely break down. Um, the, but this is observed to be insulating even, um, even above the TC. And so there's a few things that can happen. You know, one, one thing a person needs to ask is what you just said, is the crystal structure, um, is the crystal structure remaining invariant? The other thing is magnetic order. And then finally, there's just another possibility, which is that bands, semi-metallic bands can gap with interactions. Um, and so, so if you've checked the first two things, then you check that all the symmetries are satisfied and time reversal is satisfied, then you need to look at the third thing. And I think in this case, the, I think in this case, the atoms are in the right position and it's just an interacting, I think it's an intrinsically interacting material. That's my impression, but I think there's room for open questions. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so the next one I saw was uh, Karunia, uh, sorry, everything moved, Karunia S. Shirali. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, what would this look like, um, the classification theory? What Would it work at all in the context of alloyed uh, topological insulators, which don't have inversion symmetry or maybe uh, any crystal symmetries at all? Yes, that's a really great question. Um, so you, right, so I haven't worked at all in the field of disor disordered topological materials, but there, you know, there's a there's been a lot of research in this direction, um, disorder and crystal symmetry and topology. And my impression is that if the crystal symmetry is preserved on average, then it acts the same way as if you uh, as if you had the crystal symmetry completely perfectly preserved. So in other words, if you had like a mirror churn insulator with some disorder. Um, but as long as the disorder is on average uh, preserving the mirror symmetry, then, um, then you should still be able to see surface states. Uh, so, so this is actually one of the things that I've talked to Leslie Shoup a lot about. Can we use um, like alloys to move the 
uh, chemical potential around to say, realize a different phase than you would originally realize um, as long as you stay in the same symmetry group. Of course, the alloy itself is breaking symmetry. So I think the expectation would be yes, but it's it's a really interesting question. And I think like that falls under this question of, can, of predicting new materials. Alloys are not going to be listed in this database. And so that's that's where one of the, I think that's where one of the future open questions can be both for theorists, but also like on the chemistry or materials science side. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, next was uh, TC Wu. Uh, hi, Jenny, so, uh, Jennifer. So uh, actually my question was kind of similar to the previous one. So uh, I was wondering, uh, does the topological quantum chemistry have anything to say about this order in the system? But uh, I guess you already answered it par partially, but uh, so perhaps let me ask uh, in high order PI, say if you have this location or, or still disorders, then that can potentially induce uh, extra hinge mode. Then yes. uh, let's say if I have interaction, then those extra hinge mode can interact with the original one. Then um, should I expect any stability of the hinge mode in that case? Okay, that question has a lot of parts. So, right, so you allowed me to mention something that I didn't really have time to say, which is, um, right, sometimes we can use defects. Our idea is that we can use defects to identify certain types of high order TIs. And so, um, so in, in this paper, we talked about dislocations in certain types of high order TIs and showed that, showed when you can get a condition for getting these helical um, edge modes. Basically a dislocation introduces an extra edge. Um, are these robust to interactions? I think there's two things to consider. If this is a very big crystal, the hinge modes are far away from these dislocation modes, then I think that the, um, I think that the hinge modes would be robust because these things are helical and helical edge states, in, unless you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, the helical edge states will survive the presence of interactions. Now there could be, if this thing is a smaller crystal and you have these dislocation modes close to the hinges or multiple dislocations, then you could ask about interactions between different step edge dislocation helical modes. And that, you know, that is akin to, um, that's akin to this idea of a wire construction. So there's been some work on constructing strongly interacting TIs from non-interacting wires. I guess you could say the same thing here. What if we made a lot of dislocations in this crystal and then all these dislocations were allowed to interact with each other? Um, could we realize some exotic interacting phase? I think theoretically the answer is yes. I would be a little bit skeptical that that would be a robust route to an interacting phase in nature. Right, because it seems that in your database there are many materials, but in practice the real materials that people can make uh, kind of limited. I'm just wondering if in reality, interaction and disorder combined when combined together may, may destabilize some of the- Yeah, so I think, so like I said, disorder, disorder may not be such a big problem and interactions, uh, it's a question of whether the interactions can, in, can induce some more interesting phase or whether they kill the topology altogether. And that, I, I see that being a case by case question. Um, but it's definitely an interesting and open question. I think the field is starting to move that way already. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, next question is from Chimao. Yeah, Jan, uh, great talk. Um, so uh, I guess I want to ask I guess, a pragmatic question uh, you know, from this machinery. Uh, is there some sort of <clears throat> empirical rules one can use? So, so for instance, I think the COVID electron community is, uh, uh, appreciates uh, like a non-semorphic uh, yeah. uh, lattices are good because uh, even in, uh, in ion nictides, uh, glide symmetry, etc., uh, comes in. So, so besides a uh, statement like uh, non-semorphic lattice would be very interesting to look at for the purpose of studying topology. Are there some other empirical rules one could think uh, one could say that you know come out of this machinery that would be yeah. Good? Uh, so I, I guess the thing that we were, one of the things we were originally trying to do was this idea of like um, looking for these disconnected elementary band representations. So the idea would be 
we have some list of these. We know like which space groups they can occur in. Um, so it would be like a space group and an orbital content. And then we could say, if you had materials with this orbital um, at the Fermi level with partial filling, then that would, uh, then if it's insulating, then that thing would give us a topological phase. That's what we are hoping to do. And that's the route by which we identified, you know, these, these materials, uh, this thing's a semi-metal. Um, so that's what we are hoping to do. It, you know, it's, it's a bit complicated because it's not always the case that you have one orbital at the Fermi level. Okay, that's what we are trying to do. Then, you know, one of the things that I've been working on, or what's working on a bit with Leslie was extending this to use some kind of chemical guidelines. Um, and so the idea here is that uh, looking at these square net compounds, there's a lot of talk about non-somorphic symmetry. But it turns out that in these compounds, what's really special is that you have band folding. You have two atoms in the unit cell and that gives you a band folding. Um, and it's that band folding that produces these line nodes. And so we investigated like different ways that you can stack these different layers and some are non-somorphic, some are somorphic and they either give you line nodes or Dirac points but you always get these crossings anyway. And so in this particular class, we are able to kind of, um, we, we were able to deduce, the, it wasn't the non-somorphic symmetry, it's just the stacking of these square nets. And then we did this little algorithm here on the bottom of the slide. Basically, um, what we're trying to do, uh, well, th this, is actually, this is actually a cool idea of, that I should give credit to Leslie for, is if you have stacked square nets, you can identify a spacing between layers and a spacing between atoms in the layer. And that gives you a ratio of two atomic spacings and if the spacing between atoms is bigger than the uh, in-plane spacing, you can treat it as a 2D material. So that gave us a tolerance factor. So we filtered, filtered through all these materials in the ICSD, identified some structure types with that appropriate tolerance factor. And then we were able to find some other materials that could give us, um, that can give us either Dirac cones or line nodes in these 2D square nets. So I think that case by case, there's, a lot, I think that there can be more steps, which is like a symmetry analysis to show you what is the ideal crystal structure that we would want or the ideal type binding model. And then maybe some kind of geometric factor that would tell you if you have atoms with this crystal structure, like what do we, what are the spacings that we need that would likely make the ideal type binding model applicable? Mm -hmm. But we don't have a general principle for that. I think the only general principle we have is this idea of splitting the elementary band representations. And I should say something else kind of interesting, which is that, um, you know, when we were then searching for topological materials using these, this principle, a lot, of the, a lot of this turned us back to what we already knew, which is somehow honeycomb materials are promising and bismuth selenide family is the way to go. And of course we need strong spin orbit coupling. So I think that actually, you know, the human intuition that we developed searching for topological insulators before we developed this theory was actually quite powerful. Um, but hopefully we can pick up some more elements on the fringe or designer elements um, by using this. Thank you. Okay, uh, the last question I see is from uh, Shiming Lai. Hi, Jen. Um, hey, yeah, yeah, thanks for your talk. Uh, I have one. Um, Question regarding you know the uh, combination of uh, uh, density wave and uh, you know the system you know how you change uh, attune the uh, this mixing of this kind of uh, uh, electron hole with different character eventually uh, drive it to into this axon insulator. So far, um, you know the experimental wise, it's just one system, right? So I wonder, you know, in this kind of square net system, if we use this kind of you know, transgenicity wave as a concept, um, is it possible, you know, uh, you know, basically to produce a second example, you know, uh, this kind of action yeah. insulating state? Okay, so, okay, so you allow me to say something else interesting, which is, you know, this question of interactions, I think that there's different types of interacting, how do we generalize this theory with interactions? There's a few different subcases which which we can make progress on, uh, you know, one is the case of magnetism, 
which is that if you have magnetic symmetry, you can basically, in many cases, still get out of band structure, even though the magnetism is due to interactions. And so that's a case where our theory can still apply. You just have to use magnetic space groups. You're bringing up a different aspect, which is charge density waves. And in some examples, you know, a charge density wave is due to interacting physics, but it can basically give you a lower space group. Uh, it breaks some crystal symmetry, um, give you a lower space group. And then we might be able to still classify uh, we might be able to still get out a band structure with the charge density wave. So I think a person can, I think there is some algorithmic thing that we could do, which is start with a classification in one space group, consider a charge density wave that breaks some symmetry, and then ask, then move down to a, a lower space group and ask, is that lower space group realizing a topological phase? Like there's some algorithmic way to use this data and um, and predict which you could do it two ways, but I guess you could predict which semi-metals would yield topological insulators with a charge density wave. And this has been carried out. Um, I don't have a citation here, but there's some interesting work by Barry Bradlin and Ben Weeder in this direction, which is if you take a um, a weak TI and add a charge density wave, you can get a higher order TI. So there is like a hierarchy of topological states with charge density waves, and some of them have been enumerated and some of them haven't. And I think that there is a mathematical structure there, which is interesting, but also in particular cases, there could be a more useful structure for materials, um, for materials prediction. And yeah, okay, we should think more about it. And so I can just say, I mean, as you know, but just for the audience, so, so this paper um, by Xu Ming um, coming out of Leslie's group um, is exactly talking about this charge density waves in magnetic line node materials. And I think there's a lot of interesting questions here related to realizing different types of topological phases. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I see. So we're after 11.30, but I see one more question. So uh, uh, Yi Chen. Uh, hi, Jennifer. This is uh, Yi Chen. So I just have one quick question I want to check. So previously, you, you talked about like after you uh, compute all the erupts of the of for this space cube, and you can subduce it to, to see whether it can decompose into the uh, into the irreducible uh, representation you calculate from from the real space. So I just wonder, for example, like. Uh, you said it can also be promoted to the the gap system. So I just wonder after. Uh, after, if you find the band is not connected uh, using this procedure, can you say like uh, at that high symmetry point, all the bands must be, must you have that kind of topological properties or you still have to, I mean, is that general in, in the methodology of this uh, prediction? Or you still have to, you know, check the, the topological invariant at, at that high symmetry point for, for different mm -hmm. bands crossing that high symmetry point. Okay, I think I understand what you're saying. Maybe I maybe you can say something. Uh, so, so what we have here is some button which tells us uh, if an elementary band representation can be split into two pieces and realize an insulator or if not. And what we would say is that if you can't realize an insulator, then if you're filling this elementary band representation halfway, you're gonna have to realize a metal or semi-metal. If you can split into an insulator, then it's possible to realize a topological insulator, or you may still realize a metal, semi-metal, depending on energetics. Um, once you it, once you can split into two pieces, you would need to actually compute your band structure to check whether you are insulating. So just because your elementary band representation can split and realize an insulator doesn't mean that it does realize an insulator. There can always be accidental band crossings or uh, it, it just depends on energetics. Um, mm -hmm. So does that, that may partially answer your question. Yeah, I see. So, so I guess the point is that there can still be accidental band crossings. Uh, right, it doesn't guarantee that you would realize an insulator. It really, it de it's that de part depends on energetics, yeah. Okay, I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna allow one last question. Uh, um, so from Anna Maria, uh, Nidic, it looks like. Uh, Anna Maria, can you ask? Yeah, I just have one quick question, also a clarification. Uh, when, when you mentioned that uh, band structure with an odd number of uh, eigenvalues under inversion symmetry, um, 
that is will be topological. Is there any condition that this band structure has to include spin orbit coupling or not? Oh yeah, that's a very interesting question. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that was glossed over here, um, right? So the result in the, the Foucane formula tells us that if we have spin orbit coupling and we have this odd number, then we will realize a 2D TI protected by time reversal symmetry. If you don't have spin orbit coupling, there is no 2D TI phase. So it actually what happens if you don't have spin orbit coupling is that you end up realizing a semi-metal. There is not an insulating, with time reversal, there is not an insulating phase that, um, that you can realize here. And so there's an interesting paper by Chen Fong's group, which also talks about this, like it tells you the labels, which if you had spin orbit coupling would give you a TI or a topological crystalline insulator, but without you realize a semi-metal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, I think just so that we can uh, finish up. So um, let's thank Jennifer again. And um, yeah, great. So we'll see everybody tomorrow at 1030 for I believe it's Peter's talk, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, thanks, thank everybody. <laughs> Bye. All right.